and I try to hit, I try to punch, but you know, it's like a, looks like a Bruce Lee two inch punch. Nothing happens. And I, I turn around and I don't see it. I don't see this mountain lion. The rope is gray. What? The rope is gray. Ah, shit. Liam's fallen into a crevasse and I immediately thought he's dead or at least seriously hurt. And my guts had been ripped out of my body and were being contained by my flight suit. I know a mountain lion is on top of me. Welcome to episode one of the Wildertainment Podcast. I am your host, Vince, a former helicopter rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard. Welcome to the show where we talk about entertaining wilderness adventure stories. All right. Ooh, I'm excited. Woo! I'm excited for this. So for now, this this is what we call a sub podcast. What is a sub podcast, you may ask? A sub podcast is when you put a new podcast within another podcast and in hopes that it flourishes like a rose in a meadow. So the Wildertainment Podcast, folks, is currently hosted under the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast, which I host with my good friend and business partner, Cody Wright. So just so you guys get a little background as to what we're doing here, Cody Wright and I, again, are co-owners of this company called the Rescue Swimmer Mindset. And under that company, we run this podcast called the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast, which you guys may have listened to in the past. Now, that show is not going anywhere, and we love hosting that for you all. If uh, if you guys haven't tuned into the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast, it's a show where we discuss basically everything related to elite military training, the elite military mindset. So whether you're an elite athlete, so pursuing any kind of athletic endeavor, then this is a good podcast for you to listen to, to learn how to think, how to stay motivated, how to succeed, whether you're undergoing, you know, an athletic achievement, or you're trying to go down the route of say a Navy SEAL or a rescue swimmer or a Air Force PJ. That's what we discuss, how to be successful in these very challenging types of trainings. Uh, Recently, we've been interviewing incredible people um, that are in the search and rescue community, people that we've worked with, some people that we have not worked with. Recently, we had the first female helicopter rescue swimmer uh, that graduated from the Coast Guard School on our podcast, the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast. If you haven't listened to that, that's with Sarah Faulkner. She tells an incredible story. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep interviewing folks on the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast, talking. Actually, next week, we have somebody that's going to tell us about nutrition, how you can survive. Specifically, if you're trying to be, say, a Navy SEAL, um, you're going to go through BUDS. And BUDS is not the same as other types of elite military trainings. It's, It's so like destructive of your body as well as it they're, they're going to challenge your grittiness which means you need to have like high body fat to survive these cold waters that they put you in and that's why we'll, we'll, we talk about you know with the different folks to tell us how to succeed in these kind of very challenging mental and physical um you know goals that you may have so check it out. That's the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today, here on YouTube at the Wildertainment Podcast platform. And again, a subcategory of the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast. We are the Wildertainment Podcast. So to give you an understanding of why we're doing this is because Cody and I were both rescue swimmers, helicopter rescue swimmers, but what we don't talk about is the aviation survival technician aspect of what we used to do. The survival aspect of that is what this podcast is all about. An aviation survival technician was, our duty was to 
be the, the go-to person to know how to behave in a survival type situation. And that's what we want to cover in this podcast. So what you can expect, you can expect survival stories. So we've already recorded two podcasts uh, upcoming. They're going to be released every week. So every week you can expect a new Wildertainment podcast and that's going to be available again under the Rescue Swimmer Mindset podcast for now. But the videos, which will have a lot of visuals associated with the stories that we're telling, will be on YouTube under Wildertainment. So that's the first part of wilderness and the later half of entertainment, Wildertainment. So check that out on YouTube. This is on YouTube right now. Check me out. I'm wearing a lot of swag, if you can only see me, but unfortunately, most of you are listening through the radio of your car right now. Pay attention. There's a red light coming up. All right. So, Wildertainment Podcast, we're going to talk about survival stories, but we don't want to limit ourselves to only that. So, we're also going to cover what me and, I mean, we're going to have Cody on. Uh, We're going to talk about what we're truly passionate about, which is adventure stories. So anything that's related to the wilderness and that's entertaining and typically it's going to involve overcoming a challenge. So developing your mindset and your survival instincts to get through this challenging wilderness um, challenge or or adventure that you had. So the first uh, podcast, which we're going to have, uh, well, this is the first podcast, but the second podcast that we're going to have is with Gina Panuzzi and she survived a helicopter crash in the mountains which then resulted in her oh i don't even want to give away too much but her helicopter tumbling down the face of a mountain so that's going to be our first guest next week and that's not per se an entertaining story it's a grueling story it's a hard story and i'm incredibly honored to be able to share it with you guys but some are going to be fun some are going to be Oh, like, damn, that was, that was a, that was a rough listen. So first one's going to be rough. And then our third episode, we're going to have some uh, colleagues of mine from New Zealand who are renowned mountaineers who fell into a crevice. Um, My friend fell approximately six stories deep into a crevice in the mountains of New Zealand. And if anybody's familiar with New Zealand, you know, that's where they filmed the Lord of the Rings. The mountains there are no joke. So that's what you can expect in this podcast. Adventure-based survival stories and and basically just people pushing their limits in a wilderness setting. Um, myself, I am a free diver. Um, so if anybody's unfamiliar with that, that's where you, you know, you typically have long fins and you dive deep underwater to spearfish or, you know, if you're just pushing the boundaries of how deep you can go, that's kind of my background. And that, that links to the rescue swimmer past in me. Um, but I'm also very much in the mountaineering realm and in the rock climbing community. So, you know, we're going to be telling stories of all aspects of outdoor recreational sports and people just pushing it, just getting their grind on in the back country. So that's what you can expect. And I'm really excited about that because that opens up a whole platform and we have already so many great guests lined up. Um, And another one, a little sneak peek, we're going to have some, some wildlife encounter stories. So that's a, that's a little sneak peek for you. So what you can expect again, wilderness based entertaining stories. So everything's going to be set in the backcountry type of environment. It's often going to involve a survival type situation or just somebody doing something incredible. Hell, we might have some mountain bikers or some some long distance backcountry road bikers. Who's to say the podcast is open for all types of just all types of sports that can really be inspiring for our listeners. So again, Check us out. We're going to be on YouTube on the Wildertainment podcast um, and on Instagram under Wildertainment. And today will be our first interview and we will be interviewing a very special guest, Sir Vinny Two Crocs. 
Hey, it's an honor to be on the show. What can I say? Eh? Oh, stop it. The pleasure is all ours. Now, Vinny, tell us about your wilderness adventure story. All right. Yeah. Big, big pressure for me. All right. Um, the first story of the Wildertainment podcast starts back in 2014. So I was, I was at the time a recent graduate of Helicopter Rescue Swimmer School. And once you've graduated from Helicopter Rescue Swimmer School, the first thing you do is you go to Emergency Medical Technician School. And that, that takes approximately a month and a half in the Coast Guard. It's a very condensed time. And you, you learn everything involved in first responding and, and attending to a, you know, a survival or a survivor or a injured person's needs. After that, though, within approximately a year of, you know, getting qualified at your station, you go and you go to Advanced Helicopter Rescue Swimmer School, and that's called AHARS. So after doing that, oh, that's a story in itself. Maybe I should give, I'm going to give a little quick side story to my main story. So yeah, because this will tie into the whole Rescue Swimmer Mindset uh, podcast. So, so we can do a little transition here. Uh, so in AHARS, Advanced Helicopter Rescue Swimmer School, this is based out of Astoria, Oregon. And a lot of the, the flights that you do are actually just in Washington because Astoria is just on the border of Washington. So you go up there and it's, it's really big surf. And that's why they have the school there to train the rescue swimmers to operate in these high seas, high risk environments. You do cliff operations and the whole nine yards, you're, you're actively in high surf doing rescues on typically other rescue swimmers and that's the school where you know you'll often combine forces with with different branches such as the navy rescue swimmers and they'll come in and they'll they'll do deployments with us and and do this high surf training so my one of my first missions if you will the the training missions was with an individual um a another third class aviation survival technician so another rescue swimmer in the coast guard and we go out there and the the drill is i think we both free fall no sorry i apologize the this rescue swimmer this third class rescue swimmer jumps out of the helicopter and it's my duty to get him out of the high surf so i you know he he jumps out and i remember he didn't actually time the wave quite right because the 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 seas were hectic that day and he (laughs) this is a great i haven't told this in a while so he jumps out and just gets immediately collided with like another wave. So you're supposed to land on the backside of a wave. He did not. He landed on the face of it. Thus, the wave collided with him like a brick wall. So already you see his like his mask gets knocked off as he lands in the water. And uh, but he gives the I'm OK signal, which is him throwing the hand up and signaling to the flight mechanic that, hey, I've survived the, the free fall. There's no injuries. I'm okay. So even though it looked like he got knocked, he was fine. So just so you understand, there's multiple ways to hoist a survivor out at sea. So one of the quickest methods is a rescue basket. So you just put a survivor in there and you give the ready for hoist signal and they pull the person up. Another way is a strop. So the strop is typically not our favorite method because it it takes time to route this strap underneath his survivor's armpits and you have to secure a chest strap and then you give the signal. But all these things kind of dangle around. It's very hard to manage and especially when you're in, in big surf type situations. So that's not our favorite. And then we have the quick strop, which is kind of a, a better version of the strop, if you will. And you just kind of secure this strap underneath a survivor's armpits quickly. It's already all set up and you have the option of putting in a uh, strap in between the survivor's legs just so he doesn't fall through in between his arms if if his arms like if the strap was to get from like off of underneath his armpits now there's another method though of relocating a survivor in an emergency situation so this is say i don't know the first one that just came to mind is like there's a shark right there's somebody in the water there's a shark and you need to i guess move them a couple hundred yards or you know, half a mile away from this danger. And then you can then put them back in the water or, or in maybe on dry land and proceed to do a safer hoist in that location. And it's, it's quite a fun procedure to do. So the, what I was supposed to do in this instance, in this training instance was go down 
and you grab the the survivor, so the rescue swimmer in this instance, and you you basically give him a hug, if you will. Uh, and it's been it's been a couple of years, but I, I feel like when you do the hug, your yeah you you <laughs> you can wrap your legs underneath the survivor's like butt. Uh, another method is like you can put like wrap your legs through his legs, and then you're basically just hugging them and squeezing them as hard as you can. And instead of giving an arm for a ready to hoist, from my recollection, you, you just start bobbing your head back and forth. And the flight mechanic is supposed to see that and hoist you up immediately. Now, you know, a little backstory to this, the flight mechanic, let me drink some water here. The flight mechanic in this instance was a little new and you know, so, so I think it, there was a slight delay in my signaling and his hoisting. So I get lowered on a cable, deployment went fine and swim over, grab, well, actually you don't swim over. You just basically get lowered to the survivor, grab the survivor and I'm doing the bear hug and I'm giving him this head bob and the delay was like three to four seconds. And that's just, that's all you need for that next wave to come in and, and it's worse to miss the signal and just wait for that next wave. It's better if you just let that next wave pass over you instead of starting the hoist three to four seconds later. But unfortunately, he was starting the hoist three to four seconds later, which means I was getting, we, get, we basically got knocked into by a brick wall of ocean water. And we just get in, in the hoist video. If, if I thought, oh man, I wish I could find that one. Um, we get knocked out of frame of this hoist video. You just see the wave in frame and then we're boom out of frame. And now we're swinging and you know, like ideally the, the flight mechanic would have just kept hoisting a little bit higher to clear us of waves. But instead he kept us at that altitude after the big wave hit, which meant that we were vulnerable for the next wave. Right. And I recall my buddy going like I, I see him and his mask has now like swung well off of his head and he's got like a cut on his nose and he's not looking very good. And he goes like, dude, dude, drop me, like drop me, I like drop me now. And I'm like, you sure? And he's like, yep. So, you know, we're not that high. We're maybe 15 feet or so off of the water. Well, not off of the water. We're, I think we're 10 feet, but the next wave is definitely going to hit us because these things are huge. So I'm holding this guy. And I, I'm like, you sure you want me to drop you? He's like, yep. And I drop him. So at that point, another wave is coming, like I said. So I see it coming and, and now I'm no longer holding somebody. So I'm able to just yank on the rescue cable and just yoink my like pelvis upward. And I, <laughs> in the horse video, you see it. I pull myself up, but still the wave just grazes my butt but it's enough to swing me once again out of frame and now i'm like swinging on the cable and i believe i lost a glove um in in this hoist so and the flight mechanic decides you know good good decision he brings me back up into the helicopter so i'm back in the helicopter and people are kind of freaking out that the pilots and the co-pilot and the flight mechanic are like yeah um dcs are like this is this just got real like this is a training mission these waves are, are significant now. Let's, you know, let's reassess. And I'm like, reassess. That's good. You know, we, we need to, to make sure safety is like, everything's in check, but listen, like I put my mask back on. Cause that also flung off of my head. I'm like, listen, uh, Brian was his name. Brian's down there right now. Uh, I saw like he had a laceration on his nose. I don't know how he is. He might honestly have a concussion. Cause what happened was when the wave hit us, this hoist hook, which is a big chunk of metal, that's what hit his like face. And I know because it hit his face and then on the recoil of the cable, it smacked me in the face. It had, smacked me in the lip. I was like, I had a minor bleed, but I know he got like the initial hard shock of the cable getting hit into his face by the wave. So Brian was certainly concerned and I brought this up like to the attention of the air crew. And they're like, well, listen, we're, we're thinking like we should probably bring another uh, air crew in, you know, like this Vince, you just got knocked and you know, who, who's to say we can even like get Brian back out. And I'm like, listen, like there's no, 
there's nothing that's airborne right now. That's going to take like at least 15 minutes to get another aircraft out here. I don't know Brian's condition. We need to go back down there. We need to go and like, just get Brian out and then leave. And then we can see like his physical condition. Cause I have no idea how he's doing and we're seeing him. He's down there and he's got to fight these waves while we're having this conversation. So he, this, this poor guy is like duck diving while having a severe like head trauma later come to find he actually hurt his back in that um in that collision of the wave and he had to do like therapy for a while i think he was like grounded um so anyway we i'm able to convince this air crew to go back down to send me back down and grab brian so we go down and i before well actually before going down i brief the flight mechanic i go hey just so you know, when I start moving my head, because we're still going to do the bear hug, like relocation, because now it was si- like it was serious. We had to actually get him out of this big surf. So I'm like, as soon as you see my head, Bob, you need to have your freaking finger on the trigger, hoist us up and relocate us to safety. Sure enough, we go down. I grab Brian. <laughs> you could see it in his face. He's like his eyes were, were just wide open like yo let's go grab him give the the head shake we immediately start hoisting flight mechanics on his game and but nevertheless like even if he's on the game the next wave is there and and sure enough, it unfortunately hits our feet this time so we we did clear but our feet just get uh smacked and what starts to happen is the the waves as well as the propeller downwash from the the, the helicopter just throws us into a, a mad spin like i've never had a spin like this and usually as a rescue swimmer you can use your fins to basically create a, a rudder in the wind or a windmill or whatever and stop yourself from spinning but when you're doing this bear hug both of you are are in like a clenched position and you don't have movement of your feet so we're just like spinning in a circle and brian just going uh, oh. I think I I think I'm gonna throw up and he's just like kidding it's totally fine but like, <laughs> at least we both had like a sense of humor about it and if anybody's ever seen the guard finally get back in the helicopter and and we were able to share a laugh um only to assess like the injuries later which weren't the best so sorry for that long side track but anyway that's what advanced helicopter rescue swimmer school is now now I strongly recommend if you're ever in the military you get to travel multiple places for these different trainings and you get leave. So if you're in a new place, you know, use that leave and, and go explore the area. So that's always what I did. And since I was in Oregon and I'd never been in that part of the world, then I decided to to stay. And I had a colleague of mine who we're going to have on the podcast. A Oh, man, this guy, this guy's something else. This guy's better than watching a movie when he tells a story. So we're going to have uh, Josh on in just a couple weeks. Uh, I decided to go visit Josh in Washington and he served on the Coast Guard uh, small boats that do gnarly rescues out in the seas of Washington. So I was in Oregon. I decided to drive up actually with Brian, the rescue swimmer in that uh, mission that we did. And we decided to drive up and he dropped me off basically at Josh's place in, uh, in Washington. And if you guys have ever seen the movie Twilight, best movie I've ever seen in my life. The movie Twilight is based out of Forks, Washington, which is where this friend of mine, Josh, is uh, was stationed at the time. So I decided to go out there, and it's, it's beautiful because it's a rainforest. It's uh, big mountains. The I think it's the Olympus Range. And I decided to go out there and visit this goofball of a friend of mine. And again, the whole reason this podcast is I think it's tremendously valuable to take time once a year at least and go in the back country and just have an experience. And a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but there's a lot of value in doing these adventures once in a while alone. There's risk, there's higher risk for sure, but I think you know the challenge of doing these alone once in a while, it's healthy. You know, it, it's healthy to be alone in a a very very vulnerable place you need to be properly planned and that's why we're we're going to talk about these survival stories um, on this podcast but i think it's it's just something that people should just do if even if it's just a little hike and start with that you know but take and but push yourself a little bit push push your limits not in a a stupid way 
but go out there, go out in the elements, go out in the, um, I, I, and be vulnerable, be vulnerable to these, you know, the, the wildlife, understand how small you truly are in the mountains. It's something that I, I can't even describe it, but that's what I'm going to try to tran translate to you in this podcast. So my objective that I'm going to share with you today is me trying to get to the summit of Mount Olympus in Washington, which I believe is the second highest peak in the state. Now, that objective is nothing short of mountaineering, which I, to be quite frank with you, had minimal experience with at the time. This is 2014. I was fresh out of rescue swimmer school. So, you know, I, to be, to be honest with you, I was kind of cocky and, you know, I just graduated this, this very physically demanding thing and, and mentally demanding thing. So I, I approached the, the objective of conquering Mount Olympus with that same kind of, Hey, if it's challenging, I'll get through it with my mental and physical tenacity. And maybe there's something to say about that, but ultimately here's the story. I was completely like unprepared and, and, and just like not knowledgeable enough for, for an adventure like that. And that's why I say like, if you do a, an adventure solo, it's, it's healthy, but maybe, you know, be, be planned, like be prepared and it's okay if things don't go according to plan, but you know, it is good to have a, a certain amount of knowledge and experience before you truly push your boundaries, which I did not at that time. So Mount Olympus is uh 7,900 feet. It's in the Olympus range in Washington. So I went out there to the rescue swimmer training, advanced rescue swimmer training, and I brought a little bit of equipment for outdoors, but I didn't have all my like great equipment, right? Because it's just a lot to pack on top of the rescue swimmer gear. So I'm out there and I have this, this backpack and I, I remember I go to the little local store in Forks, Washington, and I'm like, hey, you guys got rain jackets? And they're like, yeah, we do. Of course, it's like Forks, Washington, except in this little local store that was open that day. They, yeah, they have rain jackets. It's like heavy duty, like out at sea, yellow rain jackets, which weigh like alone, like 20 pounds. And if, if you've ever done anything related to mountaineering, you know that weight is so crucial in being able to move fast uh, over this like high elevation gain. So I'm like, well, that, that's not going to do. And I go to this other little shop and sure they have like a cheap rain jacket. That's a lot lightweight, but it's not like a rain rain jacket. It's like a weatherproof. They call it a weatherproof. It's not waterproof, but it's weatherproof. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So I get that thing and I'm, I'm gearing up and I go to this little local shop um, as well. That's like mountaineering shop, if you will. And I, I start talking to this little old lady and she goes, you know, what's, what are you planning on doing? And I go like, oh, I'm planning on doing Mount Olympus. She's like, oh, now? And I go, yeah, why? And she goes, dude, it's not like, this isn't the season for it. Nobody's doing it. There's not going to be anybody up there. Like you realize it, like the storms, they just roll in like daily and it's getting dark at 4 a.m actually i think it was like 3 8, 3 30 or something or sorry 4 p.m 3 30 p.m maybe um she's like dude it's not the season for it and she's like all right but you got crampons and i go Cram crampa who crampons kid and i go i don't got crampons i was just gonna do it in my boots and like she's like like your mountaineering boots and i go like you mean hiking boots she's like no mountaineering boots and i go what's a mountaineering boot she goes like oh man and i'm like i think i'll be fine <laughs> And she's like, dude, at least just, just take this ice pick. And I'm like, I'm military on a budget. Right. And I can't afford to buy an ice pick. She's like, dude, I'll just, I'll rent it to you. And I go like, I don't think I can afford to rent it. And she goes like, I'll just lend it to you. Just please take the ice pick, return it when you're done. Just go out there and, and just please turn around. If, if it just gets like over your head and watch the weather patterns. I'm like, all right. So I'm um, sure enough, I'm like set up my little base camp uh, in Forks, getting ready. You know, you got, you stash, you, you put all your gear together and, and like what you're going to eat. And, you know, I'm a scrawny kid having just graduated swimmer school. I need a lot of protein. So the, the, that morning of, of like departing on my, my Mount Olympus adventure, um, I decide, Hey, 
I need a little more protein in my my kit here, my my food source, because I I guesstimate this is gonna take three to maybe four days. All right, so three to four days is planned. I go to the grocery store first thing in the in the morning. I should have left at like three a.m., which is called an alpine start, but I don't know about this, so I I just wait for the grocery store to open. I think it's at seven or eight. Go to the grocery store and I I go get my last stash of of you know protein bars or whatever. And as I'm checking out, I, I smell something. I'm like, and I go to the cash register. I'm like, Hey, what, what is that delicious smell? And she goes, uh, I think that's our rotisserie section. And I go, is that chicken? Is that, is that chicken I smell? And she goes, yeah, I think that's chicken. And I go like, Oh, and in the back of my mind, right. I'm thinking, all right, this is Washington bear country chicken chicken's not the move probably shouldn't bring a whole rotisserie chicken a for weight b for smell and c because it's just moronic to bring a freaking whole chicken on a hike like on a i don't know how many mile hike so i'm like all right here we go like should i make this 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 purchase this ten dollar purchase of chicken i go yep that's the move and I remember telling uh, the, the the store clerk, I'm like, hey, I'm going on Mount Olympus. And she goes like, oh, that's cool. Like, you're not bringing this chicken up there, are you? And I go like, yeah. And she goes like, you got like a bear barrel? And I go, a bear what? And she goes like, a bear barrel, like, you know, something to store food in so bears don't smell. And I go, no, why don't I just put it in a plastic bag? And she goes like, oh, and I'm like, hey, hey, relax, lady. I'll just double bag it. <laughs> Oh man, I'm embarrassed just telling the story actually. So, um, all right. So I double bag my chicken and sure enough, I'm, you know, this Gumby is ready for his hike and I put the pack on it. This thing's got to be 70 pounds, which is ridiculous for that short of a, of a hike. Um, and I, I only brought a tarp though, regardless of if it's 70 pounds, I only brought a tarp and I, I thought like, okay, that's going to be my, my shelter and, you know, in a sleeping bag and a sleeping pad, but I'm only going to bring a tarp and set that up in the rainforest of Washington. So I start on this hike and, you know, you start on a main trail, but old Vinny Two Crocs here, he doesn't like to stick to the to beaten path because it's like, that's too mainstream at the time. I was a hipster. I was like, I like to be off the beaten trail, which is just detrimental to the environment and not something you should do. But anyway, I, so I, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go off trail and I go off trail and within, I believe I, I did have these rain pants, I believe within, I don't know, a mile or two, I'm just soaked because you're just trudging through like just kind of a, a Amazon type of landscape in Washington in just this wet leaves as like the rain's pouring down. So I'm soaked. And at this point, it's already like early afternoon, 12. And like I said, the sun's setting at like 3.30 or 4 p.m. So I'm hiking through the mountains and, you know, I'm following this ridge line, trying to get to the top of this ridge. That's eventually the ridge line. You follow the ridge and then you get to the base of the mountain and then you start your ascent of the mountain to like the, the moraine, the ice moraine that's up there. So I'm, I'm following the, the trees, trying to get up on this ridge, finally get up on this ridge. And I find this little deer trail. And at this point, it's so thick that I'm crawling on all fours, like just hacking it through the woods. And I'm like, damn it, you know, probably should have stuck to the trail not making leeway. I probably could have covered like 10 miles that day, but instead I covered four maybe. And finally this, you know, deer path leads back to a main trail. And at this point it's getting dark already. It's I believe three and the sun setting it's, you know, you're in this dark forest. So I'm hiking. I'm like, dude, this, this is going to be brutal. Like sleeping underneath this tarp. And luckily I get to a point in the trail where they have these emergency shelters and on the emergency shelter sign, it's basically, the, it's a shelter where there's, there's three walls and a roof. So it's like a little log cabin, but there's, there's only three walls. It's not an enclosed cabin. So it's, it's an open space with four bunks and at least you're like sheltered from the rain. Right. Um, and you have, you have a flat platform to sleep on and it says only in emergency situations, do you use this not for day use? And I haven't seen anybody all day and I know it's not the season. And like that store lady said, there's not going to be anybody out there. So I'm like, you know what? Might as well make the first night easy on myself. I'm going to sleep in the emergency shelter. So set up my little camp and 
moronic me again brought like didn't bring anything that can really be eaten as a meat like sure i got snacks but i don't have anything that i can eat and not need a fire source to to cook right and i only brought like one little propane bottle so i want to make a fire to first of all dry off all my clothes and my boots and to get my like can of soup i brought like a chunky campbell's soup out there not the smartest move for weight so i wanted to heat that up and i'm i'd say like the one thing i'm maybe good at is making a fire in a in a hard uh situation i've, I've always been good at making a fire i have a lot of experience in doing that so i'm, I'm working hard but like this this is the hardest fire i've ever had to start because it's in the rainforest everything's been soaked for days on end and everything's rotten even if you one trick that you can do is you can carve into a dead tree right and at the source oftentimes there is some dry like tin tinder in there um timber not in this like predicament there in this situation there was nothing i looked everywhere and luckily i found underneath this shelter there was some wood like stored like just a couple little pieces of wood and that was enough to get me started and then i could burn the wet stuff so it took me well over an hour and a half. It's dark and I get this fire going and I'm psyched because I'm like, that's my first success of the day. I'm like, finally, something that's going to like help me with my mission. So I, I dry my boots and like an idiot, I put my boots right by the fire because normally you would hang on something near the fire, right? But I didn't have a setup like this. So I just put my boots against like near the fire, like on some rocks, right? what starts melting i'm like what does that smell that doesn't smell like campbell chicken noodle soup no that's your boot melting you idiot so now i have like a, a melted shoelace i'm like god damn it so you know now now i have like a, a dry jerky like ugh, leather boot and uh yeah so you know i, I kind of let the fire do its thing dry as much as i can but i kind of realized it's a lost cause so decided to go to bed now remember I have a whole chicken, a whole chicken that is double bagged. So there's no way any animal or wildlife could ever smell a double bagged chicken, a whole rotisserie chicken. So I'm having some of that in my chicken noodle Campbell soup or whatever, chunky soup and uh, eating this chicken. And I'm like, ah, this, this smells quite a bit. And there's, there is a lot of chicken left. You know, I have maybe half the chicken that night. I ate a lot at the time. So I'm like, all right, double bag it. And my solution to you know, managing any kind of wildlife that could be curious about this rotisserie chicken is all right. There's four bunks, right? Opposite on each side of the wall in this three walled shelter. I decide I'm going to sleep on the top bunk on the left side of the shelter. And I'm going to put my pack on the opposite side on the right, on the bottom, like near the entrance. So I go to bed, right? And I'm, I set up my ice ax that you know, this, this kind lady gave to me, I set it up right by my head rest. So I'm, I put it by my, my bed and I'm like, all right, in the case of an emergency, I have an ice axe right there, one foot to my right. And I can defend myself. Cause no, I did not have bear spray. Why didn't I have bear spray? I don't know why I didn't have bear spray. So I'm over there with my ice axe going to sleep. And I'm like, I'm a little concerned, you know, I, I don't think this is the, the best move. I'm I'm already, you know, four miles into the, the wilderness here. And there's no one going to be out here. I'm, I'm a little concerned about this rotisserie chicken. But, you know, Papa likes his chicken. So I'm going to keep it around. <laughs> go to go to bed. And I don't know if you, if, if you gain enough of experience in the wilderness, you start to get to a point where you understand certain sounds. At first, when you when you go camping, say alone, you, you're gonna get startled by just about anything you hear. You're like, "What's that? What's that?" And you're nervous, right? But most of the times, it's a branch moving. It's two trees, you know, screeching against one another. It's a squirrel, and a squirrel, like on dry leaves, sometimes sounds like a moose. Um, and as you gain your your outdoor experience, it's it's interesting because you develop kind of a second sense of what sounds are okay and what sounds are alarming and at a certain point you will wake yourself up at certain sounds that are a concern but others will you'll just kind of sleep through them and luckily i had enough experience at least at that time where i knew those different sounds and and sometimes though and this is kind of what's weird i can't describe it but sometimes you just get an eerie feeling 
It's not necessarily a sound, but you'll wake up in the middle of the night in your tent or in this case, your shelter, and you're going to you're going to feel like something's just a little off. And that's what I felt. So I woke up. And again, painting you the picture, I'm in the top bunk. My feet are facing towards that opening of the shelter. The bag is in the lower left, like it says, I'm facing out. Or like, you know, if if I sit up, I'm facing the opening of the shelter. My bag's at the lower left on, on the floor. And I could see out. And luckily it was, it was a clear moon. So, you know, I I went to bed at like six that day because, you know, the, the, the sun had already set and like maybe it was seven, but I went to bed early. So it was going to be a long night. And, you know, I think, don't think the sun rose until maybe eight to nine, you know, AM. So I was, I was in for a long night, a little restless, but I, I wake up because there's something eerie. And I wake up and I look and luckily the moon had lit everything up. And I see this shadow creeping towards me. And I've seen a lot of wildlife in before at, in this point. But I can't really label what the hell this thing is. It has long legs, thin legs but a big body. I can only describe it as it has like long legs, kind of like a mountain lion or a wolf. And it's tall, but the body is just too large to, to be that of a mountain lion or a wolf, which tend to be a little thinner. And I got to be honest, my, like my heart races like immediately. I'm like, Oh, and it wasn't, it wasn't just the fact that it's this, it's the silhouette because I don't see anything but black, a black shape. But it, it's just how it's creeping towards me. It's it's on the hunt, and it's going towards the shelter, towards that chicken. And I like froze. My first instinct went into analyze mode, like figure out what this is before scaring it off. Cause I need to know, like, this is going to be a long night. I need to know what the hell that is. Is it like a big concern? And it's just moving and, and creeping towards the shelter. And I'm just trying to figure out what it is. This is like combination of a wolf mountain lion bear. It's, it had to be one of these, but I don't know which it was. And that's what was so scary. So I just wait. And I finally just get up the courage. And I, I do like that, that classic scared, male like thing which is just like hey get 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 out of here and immediately this thing just runs out of frame it's you hear it loud but it's also elegant in the way it runs off and really creeped me out how this thing ran and i'm like well that's it here we go not sleeping tonight like there's no way there's no way i'm sleeping tonight after that and i'm up for like an hour but you know, sure enough, the sleep comes back and I'm like, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do some shifts. I'm going to do the military thing on every 30 minutes. I'll wake up. I'll wake up for like two minutes and I'm going to make some noise. I'm going to yell out, give, give, have a conversation with this creature and then go back to sleep. So that's what I do every 30 minutes. I think I had my, 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 uh, my watch and I just set the alarm every 30 minutes. I would wake up and I would sing a song and I, I forget what the song was, but I remember it was something ridiculous. Like, I don't even know if that's a song, but it was like, oh, the yellow roads of Texas. Oh, I hope you don't eat me, eat bear. And I was just like singing whatever I could just to keep this thing like at bay. Long night, do this all night. And finally, like it gets to the point in, and I should have, again, started out as an Alpine star, but I didn't sleep all like the later part of the night and the morning hits. And finally the sun's starting to set. And I'm like, man. All right, this is the time for me to like actually get like an hour of real sleep because I feel more comfortable now, right? It's it's no longer dark. There it it's dark, but it the sun is is rising. So I feel comfortable. I'm like, "All right. Let me take take a take an hour and and just rest up." So I go back to sleep. And I wake up to a pressure around my neck there's weight like on top of me 
man, I, I guess like, you know, you never know what, what you do in these situations. You never know how you're going to react. You never know like, hey, I, I hate when people are like, I would never do that in that situation. You don't know what you like, how you would behave. You might think you're a superhero in your story. You and and some people you might think would be cowards. And it's oftentimes those those realities are reversed. You know, the, the person you think would be a coward turns out to be the person that, you know, locks it in and, and handles the situation. And the person that you think would have their shit together is oftentimes the person that breaks down. I was a little like ashamed of, of my um, reaction to the situation. I have something on top of me, which I could. I know what it is. I know the way it's like on on me, adding pressure to me. I've just woken up. I'm like in a daze, but I know. I know a mountain lion is on top of me. And I'm ashamed to say my reaction is not like problem solving mode. My pro- my re- reaction is freeze, don't move. Like pray, uh, like I'm mean, I'm not like a religious person. I'm just like please make this go away and this weight is on me and as i try to move my shoulders and i'm getting out of my days i realize it's getting tighter as i try to move and it's just the pressure is on so then i start talking to myself i go like all right dude i'm like getting awake i'm like dude you're a helicopter rescue swimmer you know don't go out like this like you're going out with a fight and i'm like like the other part of me is like, I don't want to, I don't want to fight. I don't want, I don't want to move out of my sleeping bag. Like, I just want to, I'll let this mountain lion eat me. I don't want to confront this, like this creature. I can't do this. And I'm like, the other part of me is like, come on, man, just get it together. You're going to turn around and kick this thing in the face and you're going to fight until the end. And yeah, you're, you're going to die, but at least you're going to die with a fight. And this mountain lion will at least have maybe an eye, eye gouge down. I'm like, come on and i'm i but my body can't move and i'm i just i'm frozen and i'm like just psyching myself up i'm like it's gonna be a battle but at least you're gonna go out you're gonna go out on an adventure come on and i'm like all right here it is let's go and i'm like sussing all i'm just gathering all the energy i have in my sleeping bag and i'm like i'm gonna kick this muff lion in the face and it's going down so i turn around in my sleeping bag and i try to kick but Dude, you're in a sleeping bag, right? You're you're basically a, a mummy. You can't you can't you don't have any dexterity unless you creep yourself out of this sleeping bag. I turn around and I try to hit. I try to punch, but you know it's like a looks like a Bruce Lee two inch punch. Nothing happens, and I I turn around. And I don't see it. I don't see this mountain lion. I try to like yank up, and I realize I realize the sling of my sleeping bag was stuck in the crevice of this bunk bed and was cinching down very tightly around my neck. There's no mountain lion. There's nothing. There's nothing around me. I'm an idiot. The sleeping bag, I, I, I am the survivor of a sleeping bag attack. And if you've ever been in a situation where you thought you were gonna die one second and then the second, the next second you realize you're an idiot, well then, all that adrenaline just rushes out and you're like, Jesus, oh, thank God. And you just kind of, everything loosens up and you get kind of immediately a little tired. Um, so I, I, all I remember is kind of passing out and then pass back out on the sleeping bag. And I wake up and this time it's the same freaking situation. I feel weight. But now I don't feel weight on my body around my neck like I did before. I feel like weight on my feet. And I'm like, yeah, here we go again. Like just bad dreams because you had poor sleep that night. And I'm like, you know, again, in a daze and I'm waking up because, you know, if you do that weird sleep cycle of 30 minutes, that's kind of why I was like a zombie mode. I couldn't really grasp. Like it took me a while to, to truly get awake. And I'm like, dude, there's another thing on my foot. But, you know, the, my, my brain's thinking like, no, there's not. It's just, you're just tired. And I'm starting to, to wake up and I look at my feet and there is something on my feet. There is something actively weighing down on my sleeping bag and it's a crow. It's a black crow. And I'm like, 
you know, at this point, I, I just survived a mountain lion attack in my head. I'm like, dude, I don't have the patience for you right now, crow. Get the fuck off my feet. And I just kick this crow off and it flies off into the distance. And on the corner of my eye, I see what I believe is another crow because it is a black um, feature on the left side of the opening of this shelter. And I look. It's not a crow. It's a black bear. There's actually a black bear at the opening of the shelter actively with his nose buried within my bag of chicken and he's he's in the process of you know trying to sneak his little nose into the bag and it, it's really interesting because you know from one second of me freaking out about a mountain lion being on top of me which it was not but to the reality of having a black bear 10 feet away from me was i was totally like relieved and i felt quite comfortable with the situation and and the fact that there was a black bear just like you know a, a stick lank away from me and i just laid there and, and observed this black bear and he was kind of honestly kind of cute just trying to get to the chicken and i was like i wonder how long it's going to take this thing to realize i'm here because it hadn't seen me i was pretty quiet and in moving this crow and, and having it fly off so i'm just laying there and kind of watching it and i'm like wonder when he's gonna see me and as he started to actually like chew on my bag a little bit i was like all right that's enough of that i'd like to have a intact bag instead of a bare mauled bag so i just go like uh hey buddy and the bear just goes and like just freezing he's, he's like uh oh, maybe maybe if i don't move he didn't see me and i go like dude you're right there and he just just kind of runs on like a treadmill for like two steps slips falls runs out of frame and i'm like <laughs> just fucking cracking up because i'm like i don't care at this point i just i just survived a mountain lion attack i don't care about the little black bear so <laughs> i'm just relieved and i have a laugh and i'm like oh man i don't know if this chicken was worth it but i'll tell you what i'm keeping this chicken because i survived the first night and i if you remember i said that this is going to be a three-day adventure so so there I am with my uh, half a chicken left going on the hike and this day is going to start the the ascent. Like eventually I'm going to hike to the, the base of the mountain. So I believe it took at least, well, it took quite a couple miles left before I got to the actual base of the ascent part, which is still well in the rainforest. So I'm hiking and I see a lot of wildlife. It's, it's a beautiful place. If you ever get to experience the Ho rainforest in Washington, it's a, a very uh, wildlife you know dense location so see some deer i think i saw like a lot of different birds i remember seeing a couple of, um i think i saw beaver um and you know i'm eating my chicken having having a good day and i think i sleep one more night and i i continue on the the ascent and i recall another thing you might experience as you 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 go hiking and especially again if you're alone you you kind of your your senses are more aware because you're you feel more um a victim of the elements and and the risks that are that are upon you so one of the things i was seeing which i i i have the experience of seeing before is i feel like things are moving on like on the side of me sometimes or like i, I i'm take i'm getting a a glimpse of something that moved but the reality is once you get that experience is you realize a lot of times it's just like how the trees are lining up as you're walking by them. It makes it look like there's something on your peripheral that moved, but it's not, it's just, it's just your, not your imagination, but it's kind of an illusion. So at this point, I'm like, huh, I feel like I keep seeing something on my left as I'm hiking up this mountain. But I, the reality is it's probably, it's probably trees that are lining up and I keep hiking. I keep seeing it and it happens way more frequently than I'm accustomed to. And I'm like, damn, like, is it something like, am I seeing something? And I, now I'm like, my senses are, are raised and I'm, I'm really kind of keeping my eye open. And I get to this clearing out of the, the dense part of the trees. Cause I'm getting higher in elevation now. And it's, it's more of a bushy area. And I swear I see across the path, just 
quickly. It was like a fraction of a second. I swore I see a tail running into the bush. And I'm like, dude, I need to sleep. Like, I don't think, I think I'm seeing things. Like, I don't know what the hell that was, but that was weird. It was like a snake in the air or a tail. And I'm like, I don't know what that would be. So keep hiking. And I'm like, it's that eerie feeling again. You're like, is something, is something behind me? Like I keep turning around, but I, I think I see something for a fraction of a second, but then it's gone. It's like behind like a, a dense part of the, the vegetation. I'm like, damn it. Like this isn't cool. So I, I'm starting to think I need to part ways with this chicken. <laughs> so I keep hiking. And now I'm in the rocky part of the, the mountains where it's, there's no more vegetation, right? Cause it's exposed to the elements and it's in the Alpines. And sure enough, I sit down to eat like the final parts of my chicken. And I finally see what has been stalking me over this journey. And it's a, it's a mountain lion. The mountain lion is luckily a, a far distance away. He's basically on, on a, on a different hill away from me. So there's like a, a gully in between me. And on the other side, there's this mountain lion hiding behind a rock. And it's funny because he blends in with the rock very well. And they're, they're kind of the masters of, of illusion, if you will, in the, in the outdoors. And this thing is, just, <laughs> it's funny because he, he noticed me, like, as I saw, I tilted my head and I was like, Oh, there's a mountain lion right there. And <laughs> the, the mountain lion, as he's, as he sees that I saw it, I, I guess he didn't see that I saw it, but as he sees me move, he just lowers behind this rock and he, he's basically like, nope, you didn't see me. You didn't see anything. And then I'm like, dude, I see you. You're right there behind this rock. But the, the fact is the rock is only covering maybe a quarter of this mountain line. It's covering like his chest plate, but his ass and his entire like front is sticking out of this rock. He's much bigger than the rock. And he's just like, nope, you don't see me. You don't see anything. And I'm like, dude, you're right there. And I'm eating my, my last chicken drumstick off of this, this, this whole chicken. And I'm like, um, just by the way, this chicken is delicious. And I know you've been after me like the past three days. I know that was you that night. This chicken is delicious. No, you cannot have it. And this guy starts like creeping towards me slowly, like as if I don't see him. He's a far distance away. I don't feel like threatened by like just because he's got so much ground to cover and I could get rid of my valuable, which is my chicken at any time. So sure enough, and he's, he's creeping and I'm like, you know what? I think it's time to part ways with with everything I hold dear to me, my whole rotisserie chicken. So at this point, it's just scraps and I just go, you know what? just take it and i just yank it down the gully and don't do this again just you know if you have an apple core don't throw it out in the wilderness because it's not natural to the environment unless you're in like an apple orchard so don't throw a whole chicken out i was just very uneducated at the time and that's what we're going to cover in this podcast is you know proper behaviors proper survival stories how to prepare better and just incredible wilderness entertaining stories and that was my story of how I encountered in the course of four days, a bear, a mountain lion, a crow that tickled my feet. And yeah, that, that's my story. So that, that's going to be the first story of the Wildertainment podcast. And that was it. Now there, there's, a, there's a little more to that story and we'll, we'll cover that with, uh, with Josh, which I'm going to have in the upcoming week. Again, a great storyteller. And we're going to tell about like his um, how he interacted in that story. Cause at least I have the wherewithal to notify somebody and kind of give them a plan of how long it was going to take me out in this wilderness environment and how long before I came back. So Josh was aware and it was pretty funny how, uh, he reacted to the fact that I was gone for, for longer than, than expected. So that will be next on the Wildertainment podcast. What you can expect once again is a podcast where we're going to talk about incredible stories from people who have survived just difficult uh, situation in the wilderness. And I will be your host. I am Vince. Thank you so much for listening. You can find us on YouTube by just looking up Wildertainment. These are all going to be videotaped. And I would certainly recommend that you check out next week's when we have this just this grueling story of a helicopter crash. Wildertainment podcast. Check us out. 
the link is in the show notes as far as the the youtube link and yeah check us out every week entertainment podcast finny two crocs out <laughs>